really powerful to see. And I was walking from the pulpit over to my office in between services some Sundays ago, and uh, one of our elders had a heart attack, right there, flatline, about flatline five times. And the church gathered around, people went to work on it, but I looked around and we could hear the pleas to heaven for this man. And it wasn't, wasn't perfunctory. It was a passion with an intolerable burden. God very graciously answered that. He's still there in the elder now. It's amazing what he did, but you could see that. Folks, we need that kind of intolerable burden for prayer. And we need our pulpits to proclaim the whole counsel of God, to the glory of God, with confidence in the power of the gospel of grace. In fact, if I can just leave the Reformation, and before I pray, take you right back to Acts, where this powerful movement of the gospel was initiated in Jerusalem, and in chapters 9 through 12 goes to Judea and Samaria, and in chapters 13 to the end goes to the world, and this statement is made, these people have turned the world upside down. And we know it was the Almighty at work within those people that turned the world upside down. And it goes right back to the Great Commission being initiated in Acts. And what do you see? Christ's church in Jerusalem birthed in a, well, let me put it this way. Christ's church was conceived in a prayer meeting. Acts chapter 1. And was birthed in a sermon. Acts chapter 2. We must not neglect prayer and the word. So let me start this. Father, thank you. Uh, even as Charlie mentioned that wonderful passage of Scripture, James chapter 5, and verse 16, that the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. God, I, I confess to you that <laughs> I have given my life to try to understand the glorious blessings of how your sovereign grace intertwines with the enabled and powered responsibilities of your people as they serve you. We plant, we water, but you give the increase. We preach and proclaim, yet it is those that you have appointed to eternal life that come. Yet I know that you work, and it is your work, but I also know you work through prayer and the word. So I pray that you would unleash a powerful movement of prayer in the PCA, not in the army, we would not be provincial, but would you unleash it in our churches, in our pastors, in our elders, in our members, this commitment to intercessory prayer for the power of the Almighty to fall upon us and be at work in us and through us. Would you do that, O oh God? And we'll give you the glory because it's all of you and from you and to you. And may it be seen in the powerful exposition of your word from the pulpits of your church, that your word would be proclaimed. We would heed Paul's admonition, preach the word. So God, do that, and I thank you so much for those that you have set aside to speak here today. Please bless them. Please give them freedom and faithfulness. And then, as we receive that word, give us fruitfulness and may Christ, the Lord of the harvest, receive all of the praise. In, Je in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much, Dr. Reader. Before I introduce um, Aldo uh, Leon, uh, our keynote speaker, I want to say that all of our panelists and all of our speakers uh, or dynamic. The information that you are receiving here today, you may not be finding that anywhere else. Uh, and I don't say that uh, in a derogatory way, it's realistic. Uh, if you study this situation, if you study side B, if you study what has gone on, not just in the last uh, three years when I first became aware of it, but if you go back many, many, many years ago, um, th th that's what it actually started. And so the speakers we have today are very important. There are a lot, there are quite a few of them. 
uh, I'm going to have to hold everybody to a time limit, I'm sorry, to do that. And I'm going to have my iPhone, and uh, the time timer will go off. That's so we can get through all of it. I encourage you to listen to what they have to say, and then to read more about what they're saying. To log onto their websites, to read the books that are being published by some of these speakers. Um, you know, the, the information is available there. The information that I sent out, what you responded to, and I am so grateful that you responded to it and that you are here today. We even had people that uh, uh, did not register but wanted to come. And uh, so some of them will be coming over, and there may be some seats in the back. I see there's some here, maybe. Some of the people weren't able to come this morning, but we are so blessed that you are here. Aldo Leon, our uh, first speaker, uh, our keynote speaker, uh, is pastor of Pinelands PCA in Miami. Very readers very familiar with Pinelands because that was his first pastor. He is a second generation. Aldo is a Cuban American and is known for passion for teaching God's truth. In his biography, Aldo writes, I noticed that the passion for lost souls to encounter the resurrected Jesus was something that existed primarily in doctrinal statements and words, but not in the lives of the churches. The church has, in some ways, become a place for good and moral people, rather than a place for sinners who need to be saved. I began to pray regularly about the man to feel the burden for church planting. I desire to establish churches strong in doctrine, practical, and consuming passion to reach the lost souls of community. Pastor Leon is our keynote speaker this morning, and our keynote speaker sets the tone and energy of the event. As you speak, all know, may we imitate your passion for God's truth. Welcome. All right, I'm going to get right into it. So I'm not going to be making a case uh, this morning as to why side B is simple. Um, I think Todd will do some of that. Uh, what I want to do is speak to those in the PCA who know it is, um, and what are we to do about it. Uh, I think it's not sufficient for us to simply agree on what is evil, but we must agree on what is the response to that. Uh, see, Paul didn't just tell people to agree theologically with him, but he then told the church to silence those who were in theological error. There's, he who desires the work of an elder desires a noble work. We have to do things with what we agree. So this will remind us of a few things uh, as I desire to do that. And first is to remind us of the covenantal nature of the church. So we are not congregational. The many speaking by themselves are not Episcopal, one speaking over the many or for the many. We are the many speaking as one. So when we're talking about uh, a gay Christian or a gay pastor, we're talking about someone in our church. It's a member of my church. I, I'm a, I am a Presbyterian. Um, this is very personal to all of us. And therefore, you can't distance yourself from these kinds of things and people. The second thing I want to bring up and remind us is the complexity of heresy. I think when we think of heresy, we think of someone who denied the Trinity, but let me read Revelation 2, 6. It says, yet you have this, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Notice this error that's being confronted is the works of the Nicolaitans, not simply their beliefs. And the reason why there's a connection between what we do and what we believe in heresy is because the doctrine of God is connected to the law of God because the law of God reflects his character. So if you have an aberrant view of God's law, you will inevitably go back to have an aberrant view of God. And what we have in the PCA is people that are redefining God's law and standards, denying the reality of sinfulness in the affections and desires, saying that, or well, let me quote somebody, I won't say their name. Faithfulness is not revealed by the absence of sexual temptation, but by the presence of obedience surrender. That is a 
redefinition of God's law. It denies the reality of surrender in the affections and desires and inclinations. And so when you're redefining the law of God, you will inevitably redefine the character of God. And when you redefine the law of God, you will also redefine the gospel. Because the law is a tutor that leads to Christ. You then change the standards and adjust them. Then you will eventually find yourself to believing a different gospel. Though you're not preaching a different gospel yet. You will get there. It's just working backwards. Average doctrine leads to average life. Average life to average doctrine. Let me remind you of what the larger professor says about morality and God's law. Nine, section four, that where a duty is commanded, the contrary sin is forbidden. And where a sin is forbidden, the contrary duty is commanded. So when you have someone who says it's sufficient to simply not steal, but you don't have to do with ethical opposites, you're redefining the law of God. The opposite of sexual perversion is not celibacy. It's its ethical opposite by the grace of Jesus. So when you're redefining the law of God and the standards of God, you will find yourself in aberrant theology when you're already there. New standards for our elders, lowering the bar will lead to new doctrines for elders. The second thing, the third thing I want to bring up is the necessity to be repeatable as elders. We must be repeatable. We cannot be unicorns that are not repeatable. So I ask myself many times, what would happen if everybody did what I did? Not just what am I doing, but what will happen if everybody does what I do? You know, I'll read First Timothy 3, it says, this thing is trustworthy. If anyone is, aspires to the office of the overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach the husband of one wife. So I acknowledge that in the church there is a unique person that Jesus says is not the average person who has the gift of singleness. But the gift of singleness is not because you have a perversion. The gift of singleness is because you are very godly and you don't need a woman. So, if you don't have that gift of singleness, the question you ask yourself, what would happen if everybody did what we did? And if everybody was the celibate gay Christian, we could not be a covenantal theological church. We cannot be, I will be a God unto you with your children if everybody wants to be a celibate gay Christian as the example of a pastor. Forget the creation mandate, forget Ephesians 5 and 6. And I, we can't want to be simply an example for people that have a certain struggle. We must be an example for the regular member of the regular church. What the church does not need is unicorns that are examples for other unicorns. The church needs regular patterns for regular Christians as the officers who set the tone and pace of the church. If you're not repeatable, you're not ordainable. If you're not repeatable as a pattern for normal Christians, you're not repeatable. I also want to remind us of the viral nature of sexual depravity. 1 Corinthians 5, 6, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens a whole lump? Clean out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. See, sexual sin and homosexual sin is the leaven that leavens the whole lump. And simply because side B is not yet as leavened as side A, it's still leaven that needs to be cleansed, according to Paul. And the time to act with cancerous things is sooner, not later. If you wait for chemo, it's too late. You don't wait for the progress. You do it immediately, unless you wait too long and it's too late. You don't manage this stuff. You don't steward this stuff. You don't identify with this stuff. You remove it. Passivity, when it comes to sexual sin, is viral, and viral things demand immediate attention. So if you don't like the slippery slope principle, how about the leaven principle? A little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump. And I also want to remind you of the severity of sexual compromise. The whole all sin is sin conversation is partially true, but partially a lie. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, flee from sexual morality. Every other sin a person commits is outside of the body. But the sexual moral person sins against his own body. These sins of a sexual nature are distinctly destructive to your physiology. 
They're distinctly destructive to the institution of family and creation. The sin of homosexuality distinctly destroys civilizations. It's not just like everything else, though there is a commonality. The sin of homosexuality, whether it's side B or side A, that's my case, demands a worldview revolution, not simply just an ascent to the sin. See, theft is bad, but it doesn't come with it a worldview revolution. The homosexuality worldview sin comes with a demand for a worldview revolution. Therefore, it is more serious. Homosexuality also eviscerates masculinity and leaves our churches defenseless from masculine men who protect the church as men, not as something in between side A and a true biblical man. I also want to remind you of the catastrophe of tolerance. The catastrophe of tolerance. I have this against you, that he tolerates that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching my servants to practice sexual morality. See, tolerance is very dangerous. And it's become somewhat of the 11th commandment, I think, in many evangelical circles, including ours. The middle way, the via media, is very, very dangerous. You need to follow your trajectory. Where does this tolerance to something aberrant go to? And according to Revelation, tolerance in the face of ethical compromise will split your churches, will lead to provoking God to discipline and judgment, will lead to him pulling out of a sword, will lead to churches being open but having new spirituality and no godliness, a form of godliness but no power. It will lead to death and God's severe response. It will lead to a bunch of churches remaining open like the PCUS with Ichabod on the door. There's no life in there anymore. There's simply liturgy and a statement that means nothing in the face of tolerance. I also want to warn you against functional congregationalism. I'm going to read something that was written, uh, and I won't say what it was about. I'll, I'll, release, I'll, I'll release that later. We have no rights to institute and prescribe tests of Christian character and church membership, not recognize the sanction by saints in, in the sacred scriptures. And our standards by which we have all agreed to walk, people don't say anything different, okay? We must therefore leave this matter with the sessions, presbyteries, and synods, the judicatories to whom pertains the right of judgment to act in the administrative discipline as they may judge to be their duty. You know what they were talking about? Slavery. The assembly gathered to discuss a decisive ethical issue. And instead of acting decisively, they said, let's functionally be congregationalists and then everybody in their own presbyteries do whatever they want, even though we know they're not doing what they should be doing. And functional congregationalism, the refusal to act in the assembly as the local expressions of our polity refuse to do what is necessary will lead to a book of judges kind of denomination where every presbytery is doing what is right in their own lives. A study report with amen and let's everyone figure it out will be disastrous if it is not accompanied with decisive action at the assembly level as good Presbyterianism. Let me just say that adding rules to enforce our polity is not Pharisaism, it's Presbyterianism. That was said last night. All right, I have 20 minutes, I need to keep going. I also want you to remind you of the deadliness of self-preservation. The deadliness of self-preservation. Ezekiel 33, 7. So you, son of man, I have made a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear work in my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked one, you shall surely die. If you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from his way, that wicked shall, person shall die in his iniquity, for the blood I will require at your hands. Paul quotes this in his New Covenant, New Testament, ministry. You may be thinking, it's not my problem, it's not that serious, but what God says, if there is danger, if there is ethical compromise, and you don't blow the trumpet, but you pick up a flute or a harmonica or a piano, you don't blow the trumpet, God says, I will deal with you, and I will hold you accountable. Your silence will demand a reckoning with God. You can silence me, you can do whatever you want with me, but you will deal with God 
if you don't blow the trumpet in the face of wickedness. And we have wickedness in our midst. Paul says, it's a very small thing for me to be judged by you or any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself. I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I am thereby not a good. It's the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment for the time that the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness. Listen, you will not stand before your presbyteries. You will not stand before your sessions. You will not stand before your friends. You will not stand before your seminary buddies. You will stand before the Lord of glory one day. And your Lord who loves you and died for you says, blow the trumpets. Don't play the heart of harmony in the face of wickedness. If you play harps when it's time for trumpets, then the Lord will come to the assembly with swords eventually. All right. I'm done with my statements. Now I want to answer some objections. I'm actually doing well on time. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I want to address the boogeyman of the culture war. Oftentimes when we address this, it is said that this is the culture war boogeyman. And let me just say this. Ephesians 5 is not the culture war. 1 Thessalonians 4 is not the culture war. The seventh commandment is not culture war. 1 Corinthians 6 is not culture war. Genesis 19 is not culture war. Leviticus 18 is not culture war. It is God's ethical standards for his covenant people. And we can... Certainly, we can approach ethics in a worldly way. But when we approach ethics with the power and preeminence of the gospel, it is not culture war. It's simply being a Christian who loves God and his glory and wants to express that in his actual place of church life. I also want to address the objection of shared theology. We all share theology. And let me just say this. Doctrine devoid of judicial consequential responses is not a shared theology. Doctrine devoid of judicial consequence is not shared theology. Exodus 24, you shall not make for yourself a carved image of any likeness of anything that is on heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the water under you. You shall not bow down and never serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity. I'll stop there. Further down it says, you shall not make the, take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord God will not hold him guiltless, who takes his name is Bane. Bane, notice something. Who God is, is related to a visiting, a reckoning, a consequence, a guilt. What we believe goes hand in hand with what we judge and discipline over. Let me say that again. What we believe goes hand in hand with what we judge and discipline over with a consequential severity. It's not sufficient to have reports of theology with advice without a judicial consequence to that which we hold confessionally and believe what God, our doctrine, which says what God is to command us to believe about God and what duty requires of man is meaningless, devoid of judicial consequence. The difference between progressives and confessionals historically is not theological. Oftentimes, it's oftentimes judicial. And what is actually being confessed will be expressed with what actually has consequences for departing from, not simply what is Confess. I, will, I know what you believe in light of what you try and adjudicate when it's not believed. And I know what you don't believe in light of what you don't try and adjudicate. Verbal affirmation is not enough if there's not a willingness to conduct enforcement. And in my opinion, I'm only 40 years old and I look probably younger than 40. In my young opinion, what we have seen in the PCA with the SSA conversation demands a judicial consequence that goes hand in hand with our shared beliefs. Lest our beliefs simply become nothing more than appendix. You know what appendix is? You can lose it and you still live with your other organs. The doctrine of sanctification will be nothing more than a useless appendix that we can throw away and cut out the surgeon if it does not accompany with judicial consequence and enforcement in our documents. What you, are, what you believe about our theology will go hand in hand with how you enforce ordination standards judicially. I also want to bring up the numerical abundance of sin fallacy. The numerical abundance of sin fallacy. So, when we discuss this in our presbytery, they're like, well, there's much more important thing to deal with, like pornography. More people are into porn 
than into side B pastoring. That's an interesting argument, but it's also a weak one. See, what David did in 2 Samuel 24 with doing the census was not numerically abundant in Israel at that time. There were many more people sinning in many more ways in Israel, but yet the nature of a person with an office of authority in the church doing something perverse and sinful is greatly severe, though it's not numerically abundant. God almost killed Moses for not baptizing his baby. Obviously, it was circumcision. Why such a severity? Why a death penalty for not administering the sign? Because you are an officer, a leader of the church. And when somebody has a sacred office, and acts the way they have acted. It is worse than a million Christians struggling with porn. Because Paul says, pay attention to your life and to your teaching. And so doing you will save yourself and your, and, your, and your hearers. You see, your life, pastor, and your virtue goes hand in hand with the life of a congregation. It is utterly Severe, though it's not as numerically abundant. I have a few more things. I might, I might actually make it 25 minutes. Praise God. My church is praying for me, so that must be it. All right. I also want to address the illusion of unity, absent of purity. The illusion of unity, absent of purity. The, 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 the fourth sacrament, or the third sacrament of the church, I think, is this unity concept, devoid of purity. Let me read Joshua 5.25. Joshua said, why do you bring trouble on us? The Lord brings trouble on you today. And all Israel stoned him with stones. So, so notice something. One person was doing something, and they had a unity, but there wasn't a purity in that unity. So therefore, they were being defeated by the enemies of God because there was unity. Everybody's together, but there was not purity. And until they had the unity of ethics and purity, there was no point and power in their unity. They burned him with a fire and stoned them with stones, and they raised over him a great heap of stone that remains to this day. And the Lord turned his burning anger. Therefore, this day the name is placed the Valley of Abel. Let me just say this. If we have unity in the PCA, devoid of purity in the office, we will not be able to destroy the strongholds of the devil as we ought. We will not be able to withstand the assaults of the dark prince as we should. We may not die, we may still exist, but we will have no real progress and we'll just simply have fake statistics. If any of you like basketball, Russell Westbrook averaged a triple double, which meant nothing for his team. We will have statistics, we will have numbers, but they will be empty statistics if there is a unity devoid of purity that is tangible, that is judicial, that is ethical, that is in the office. And what is needed in the PCA, I believe, and my humble, very young opinion, is the unity to turn against wickedness with stones, metaphorically speaking, and deal with it and have a unity in holiness, in purity, in fidelity, not simply a unity devoid of such things. I also want to address the so-called repentance that oftentimes is not repentance. What about repentance, Pastor Aldo? Let me talk to you about worldly sorrow for a moment. So I find it, Paul says in, in Romans 7, 21, I find that there's a law when I do right. I want to do right, do what lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see my, in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. This is repentance. Wretched man that I am. I am... I see wretchedness in me as I process my depravity. So, repentance is not, that wasn't helpful. Repentance is not, that was not wise. Repentance is not, that was careless or ill-advised or imprudent. Repentance is not, this contributed to confusion. Repentance is not, this potentially invited error. A pinch, you know what repentance is? Attraction to men is offensive to God and it provokes his wrath. Repentance that is biblical is the term gay Christian is an abomination that blasphemes the glory of God. I'm sorry, that's repentance. 
Repentance is acting like sin is to be managed and not mortified. Is worthy of hell and I'm sorry. Repentance is comparing in any way sexual sin to paraplegics is evil and awful. Wretched man that I am. Do you forgive me? That's repentance. That's repentance. The other stuff that I'm talking about is penance. It's penance. It's political penance. And on my last thought here, the good theology objection. You see, many times that a man is credible because he has a good theology. He has been schooled. He's been examined. It seems that in church, the church has become a place where academia and the intellect has become the sole place of pastoral credibility. But let me tell you something. We are two signs, two signs, two marks of the church, church, right? It is the proper preaching of the gospel and the proper administration of the sacraments. So you stand before the Lord theologically, and you also stand before the church, the Lord judicially, in the sign of covenant renewal. You know what they don't do in seminaries? They don't administer communion. I hope not. You know what they don't do in your exams, pastor? They don't administer communion. Communion is administered in the local assembly with the local minister. And what a man believes goes hand in hand with how he is judged at that place of sacramental covenant renewal about his belief. It was at the Lord's table that God judged Judas for his beliefs. It's the table where God judged the Christian church for what their beliefs. And I say to our church, it is the table where your doctrine and your life come together before the Lord. And at that table, we come together for judgment. We come, Lord, judge me in a way that brings cleansing. It's the judgment that renews or the judgment that brings chastisement. We need judicial theology where a man, as he stands before the Lord and his life before the Lord in, the, in this in covenant renewal, goes hand in hand with what he believes. Let me remind you something about our confession. This is on sanctification. The, the, vir the virtue of Christ's death and resurrection by his word and spirit going in, the dominion of the whole body of sin is destroyed, and several lusts thereof are more and more weakened and mortified, and they're more and more quickened and strengthened in all saving graces, the practice of true holiness. It doesn't matter how good your theology is if you're not at the table embracing the totality of all of the old you as dead, buried, and gone. If at the table you are not, before the Lord, judging yourself as entirely dead, buried, and gone, but you are holding on to the old Adam, you are not fit for ministry or the approval of others. If at the table you are not pronouncing yourself in light of that judgment, you cannot simply just describe the Westminster Confession. confession. And not at the table subscribe that your sin repulses you, 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 you renounce your sin, you hate it, you despise it, you, you, you don't justify at the Lord's table, you don't excuse it. At the Lord's table, you say, Lord, all of my horrendous inconsistencies and my awfulness, I commit them to you and I ask you for a gracious judgment. You don't make conferences about your old self. You go, to the, you go to the table of your old self and you say, Lord, I hate the old me. Lord, cleanse me. I renounce me. You don't justify the old self. You don't pay the old self. You go to the table and you renounce the old self. If you're not that man at the table, you're not that man fit for finishing or the approval of others. If at the table you're not saying, Lord, I pray that your judgment in Jesus would cleanse all of my thoughts, all of my desires, all of my longings, all of my actions, renew them, weaken them. I believe in your power to, to do everything that you have said in your word. If, if that is, if you're not saying, Lord, kill them, extinguish them, don't manage my depravity, Lord, extinguish it. I don't want to want to sleep with women no more. Remove it. If that's not you at the Lord's table, then you are not fit for gospel ministry. the table, you are not embracing the Lord's judgment. And he says, it's not good for a man to be alone. And the judgment that says to every man that God made you, not for celibacy, but for a woman. At the table, you're not saying, Lord, 
I've been struggling this for years, but I believe that you made me not simply to abstain from that which is wrong. You made me to behold and enjoy and participate in that which is true and beautiful. And I haven't seen it yet, but yet I am confessing that at this table, as I eat and I drink, the Lord is going to make me a man who lives as an example for men and loves a wife and covenant with her and not some celebrate unicorn. And eating and drinking at the table with hope, hope, hope that God would give me everything that I have in Christ. I don't want management. I don't want hospice. I, I don't want toleration. I don't want understanding. I want the judgment that cleanses and brings me all into the opposite of my inconsistencies. So I will close with this. Enforce your beliefs, please, church. Enforcement is not extremism. Enforcement is not legalistic Phariseeism. Enforcement is not the extremity of one side. It is the work of the regular Christian and the regular church. And let me just conclude with this thought. The Apostle Paul was not immoderate. You don't get your head cut off because you're a moderate. Jesus was not a moderate. As a matter of fact, no one in the Bible was a moderate. Not Elijah, not Elisha, not Moses, not Joshua. They were men inflamed, impassioned, emboldened with insanity. I mean, I'm, if I'm out of my mind, it's for Christ. And what is necessary in this day is not moderation, but reformation with passion about the glory of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. We don't read about moderates in church history. Luther was not a moderate. Calvin was not a moderate. There, no one is a moderate that did something for God's glory in a time of need. That's my plea to you as a young man, new to this denomination, but very excited about its future. But there will be no future if you don't act in the present and do what is right before the Lord. I'm done. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Adam, for your passion. Thank you for your knowledge of Scripture. Thank you for your ability to be able to communicate it. Todd Pruitt is a senior pastor at Covenant Presbyterian Church in Shenandoah Valley in Virginia. There's a famous line from a movie, uh, from the movie Shenandoah, after the youngest son has been captured. Any of you have seen the movie Shenandoah, you'll remember it. Charlie Anderson, the father played by Jimmy Stewart, mounts up to go in search of boy. Jacob, his oldest son, begins to question Charlie. Dad, how can we go after boy if we don't know where he is? Charlie responds, son, if you don't try, you don't do. And if you don't do, what on earth is there worth living for? From the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, let's welcome another man of character, Pastor Todd Pruitt. Several days ago, I changed completely the content of this address because I, like so many of you, were told that suddenly the PCA has no issue with side B homosexuality. And so I decided, well, that's where I need to go with this. And that's where, in the face of that, I want to read to you 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, 
we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. This morning I'm going to operate under the presupposition that words have meanings and that it is indeed possible to communicate meaningfully with words through the open statement of the truth. I was unaware of the term side B homosexuality or side B until I became an ordained minister in the PCA. And I heard that phrase being used repeatedly, sympathetically, by elders within my new denomination. And being relatively new in the denomination at that time, I was shocked. I heard numerous times in many different forums from uh, personal communications with other pastors in the PCA to social media posts that the PCA is side B affirming. And I was glad that the PCA was not side A affirming, but I was troubled to hear side B spoken of as though it were just simply a manifestation of historic biblical Christianity. And of course, it was in 2018 when a PCA church hosted the first Revoice conference that the term Side B really entered the PCA's lexicon. Side B, gay but celibate, homosexual in orientation, six on the Kinsey scale, ongoing homosexual desires, not straight, sexual minorities. These are all terms we have heard in the last four years mentioned publicly, repeatedly, and sympathetically within our beloved denomination. We have been told by some elders that it is important for missional purposes that the PCA ordain celibate gay men to sacred office, that we need the leadership of celibate gay men, side B homosexuals. We've been told repeatedly to admire the great courage of side B homosexuals and how costly it is for them to follow Christ. So I don't know what to make of the new claims that there is not, nor has there ever apparently been, advocates of side B homosexuality within the PCA. I can only conclude that we have brothers and sisters among us who are either very confused or forgetful or dishonest. Again, the first Revoice Conference, which celebrated such things as the preservation of so-called queer culture in the new creation, all the way through issues like quasi-marriage relationships between homosexuals. That conference was held at a PCA church in 2018, and so far, all attempts to exercise proper church discipline have failed. So I'm not now going to pretend that the damage done to our denomination by the incursion of the ideas that have come out of Revoice and Sidebeism have actually not really happened. Now, I have had cordial and continue to have cordial correspondence with brothers in the PCA who disagree with me on my position regarding Sidebeism and Revoice. And in that correspondence, some of them have stated to me, these are pastors in the PCA, that while they are personally uncomfortable with some of the content of Revoice, they nevertheless believe that the PCA, as a big tent, so to speak, should have room for side B homosexuality and its advocates and many of the ideas that have come to us from Revoice. One teaching elder in the PCA close to a year ago on his Twitter account stated sympathetically, quote, Presbycast, I think I saw Brad back there, hi Brad, Presbycast and Aquila are confused when they suggest that every denomination that has embraced side B eventually embraces side A. This fails to understand what side B is and that the PCA has always been side B. Or how about this? From the Twitter account of another PCA pastor, quote, celibate gay, SSA, side B Christians are among the most faithful, persevering, courageous brothers and sisters I know, models of cruciform discipleship, self-renunciation, and indefatigable love for Christ. The church needs your testimony, example, witness, and leadership. Incidentally, I do not believe that I am in line 
to be considered particularly courageous or cruciform or indefatigable loving towards Christ simply because I have not cheated on my wife. Now, I could mention the statement from the Twitter account of another teaching elder from several years ago who publicly congratulated the LGBTQ community on their right to marry. And when challenged on that, he said that it was proper for him to do that because, quote, marriage is a civil institution. No, sir. Marriage is a holy institution. And a pastor in the PCA should know that. Over the last four years, we have seen the words of our Lord in Matthew chapter 19 regarding eunuchs. We've seen those precious words distorted to justify a side B homosexual identity. In an event in a PCA church, the year before the first Revoice conference, one of our pastors told a young man who struggles with same-sex attraction that Jesus must have experienced the same thing, and he justified this claim by appealing to Hebrews 4 that Jesus was tempted like us in every way. Now, I'll be charitable and call that sloppy doctrine, when in reality, it's blasphemy. And such things ought to grieve us. There's a reason that overtures 23 and 37 passed by such an overwhelming majority at last year's General Assembly. And it's not because over half of the members of that General Assembly, in fact, the, the clear majority of that General Assembly, it's not because we are suffering from some collective delusion. Those same overtures passed, though we are now understanding, they did not reach the two-thirds threshold to impact our book of church order, but they did come close. And those who hated those overtures are well aware of that. The reason for the popularity of those overtures is because the majority of the PCA knows we have a problem and it needs to be dealt with decisively. One of the things that's enabled the rise of Sidebeism within the church is the growing influence of therapeutic language and categories from our pulpits. Sin has now become brokenness, as though the two words are synonymous. I have no doubt that sin causes brokenness, but it is quite clear that sin and brokenness are not synonyms. And because of this, the gospel is increasingly conceived of in terms of its emotional benefits rather than the forensic work of Christ in the work of atonement. And this shift is seen in the ways that some of our own churches define the gospel. For instance, one PCA church on its website states the following under the heading, the gospel. Quote, the gospel of Jesus reveals that the loving God who made everyone and everything never gives up on anyone or anything. Because of Jesus, the future of humanity in the world is glorious, and everyone is invited to participate free of charge. Joel Osteen would be proud of that statement. That's their statement about the gospel. No cross, no sin, no atonement, no justification, no sins forgiven, no hope, no gospel. Now, no church is divinely commanded to, divine the, to define the gospel on their website. As far as I know, there's no command for a church to have a website. But if you have a website and therein define the gospel and you get it terribly wrong, this should be a problem. I could give you dozens more examples just like that. But I will simply say this. Where Christians are confused about the gospel, and you can count them, there will be confusion about the biblical doctrines of sin, regeneration, and sanctification. In terms of homosexual desires, those who advocate for side B repeatedly appeal not so much to the scriptures or our confession, but mostly to the authority of their own lived experience. I would encourage you to listen to Pastor Greg Johnson's speech on the floor of General Assembly in Dallas in 2019. It is easily found. And I am not here to attack Greg Johnson. He is a brother in Christ. I do not question his sincerity. He and I agree 
on a number of things. But I'm also deeply troubled by many of his repeated public statements. Pastor Johnson, in his floor speech and elsewhere, has stated that he is, quote, a six on the Kinsey scale. Now, you can look that up and do your own homework if you'd like. I will simply say this, that it is deeply troubling for a number of reasons. Troubling that a pastor in our denomination would appeal to something as discredited as the Kinsey study as a means to understand his own sinful desires. In Dallas, Pastor Johnson made this statement, quote, Jesus did not make me straight. Now, there's a freight train of important presuppositions and doctrine in that little statement. Presuppositions about Jesus, about the doctrine of creation, about the doctrine of humanity, about whether sexual orientation is even a proper category for human and Christian identity in the first place. And in that same speech and elsewhere, Pastor Johnson draws a direct comparison between his unnatural sexual desires, by the way, a term that he does not use, and physical disability, which is rather standard side of homosexuality. Pastor Johnson said that his homosexual desires are so fixed that he will likely need to be cremated after his death because he will have no family or loved ones to take charge of his body. Friends, that is utterly tragic and our hearts ought to break for this man. I hope that no one in any of our churches will ever have such a bleak outlook. Now, if you were there in Dallas that evening in 2019, you will remember that Pastor Johnson's speech was vigorously applauded by elders in our denomination, pastors. And yet again, we are now being told that there is no side B issue in the PCA. So I'm not here to play games of sophistry or historical revisionism. I'm also not going to pretend that public relations is the same thing as repentance. I'm going to proceed with the notion that words actually mean things and that ideas can be stated and understood without dying the death of a thousand qualifications. So all of this begs the question, does the Spirit's work of sanctification extend to our desires? Just how effective and extensive is the Spirit's work of sanctification according to the Scriptures in our confession? Does the Spirit's work remain strictly in the precincts of our actions? while being largely ineffective in terms of what lies below the surface in the realm of our desires and our affections and our inclinations. Advocates of side view homosexuality, including some elders in the PCA, state rather confidently that most, indeed the vast majority of homosexuals, will never see their, quote, orientation change. In his new book, Still Time to Care, Pastor Greg Johnson writes this on page 199, quote, sexual orientation is relatively fixed. Change is so rare. Hope is beyond our grasp until we reach the eschaton. You see there how bereft of hope Sidebeism is. But any alternative to that, any alternative to to what amounts to a no-change-in-this-lifetime approach to unnatural sexual desires is characterized by men within our own denomination as some sort of a flimsy, pray-away-the-gay solution. We've been told that it's Wesleyan, perfectionism. Well, I personally don't know anyone who advocates a, quote, pray-away-the-gay solution, but I do know men and women who used to be homosexual and no longer are. Indeed, the scripture gives us the ground for such hope. Now, there are all kinds of ways that our hope is anchored in the eschaton, absolutely. But hope that God can and does sanctify our desires in this lifetime is thoroughly biblical. Listen to Paul's wonderful benediction in 1 Thessalonians 5. It tells us something about the extensive work, the scope, if you like, of the Spirit's sanctifying power. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, that is, across the breadth of your humanity. The Spirit's sanctifying work is not limited simply to outward choices. 
but it is a complete work, not being completed in perfection in toto in this life, but it is comprehensive throughout our life. May the, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. And we are being told by pastors in the PCA that he will surely not do it. Romans 6, 5 through 7. For if we have been united with him in a death like, like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Romans 6, 14. For sin will not have dominion over you, since you are no longer under law, but under grace. And yet we are told by some pastors in our denomination that sin will continue to have dominion over your desires until you die. Of course, the scriptures are commanded, are filled with commands for God's people to put away sin, to put to death sin, to flee from all manner of sin, including sins that take up residence in our desires. Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Colossians 3, 5, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Again, in his book, Still Time to Care, on page 199, Pastor Johnson writes this, quote, God has called me to steward my sexual orientation in obedience to him. I simply cannot find any way to make such a statement conform to scripture, either about the legitimacy of the category of sexual orientation to begin with, or even more specifically, about how we can steward a sin in obedience to God, unless... We believe that unnatural sexual desire is not inherent sin. And we are being told that in the PCA, no one believes that. It's not true. If we exempt certain sins, particularly sins that the scriptures identify as particularly damaging and abominable, if we exempt those sins from the Spirit's work of progressive sanctification, we are undermining the scripture's own testimony. We are surrendering too much spiritual real estate to the world, the flesh, and the devil. J.I. Packer notes that sanctification in this life, quote, is not of sin being totally eradicated, that is to claim too much, or merely counteracted, that is to say too little, but of a divinely wrought character change freeing us from sinful habits and forming in us Christ-like affections, dispositions, and virtues. Packer goes on to write this, quote, that sanctification is the moral renovation whereby we are increasingly changed from what we once were. And in this way, Packer is merely affirming what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God, and such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and by the Spirit of our God. To so identify with unnatural sexual desires that you claim that it is an orientation of your life, which will likely never change in this life, to claim that is to do violence to God's own words concerning the Holy Spirit's work of sanctification. It is very helpful review of Greg Johnson's book, Still Time to Care. Peter Jones, I'm just buttering him up writes this, quote, Johnson posits that Paul was not talking about a radical emotional change 
and the deep cleansing of sexual desire. And here Jones quotes from Johnson's book, quote, God was not promising orientation change. He was promising the grace to forsake an unrepentant pattern of sex with other members of the same sex, end quote. Jo uh, Jones goes on. But we must wonder, can this principle be applied to the other categories of sinful unbelief mentioned by Paul? Can a believer live his whole life constantly lusting over women, though never committing adultery, and still affirm his unity and fellowship with his holy Savior? Can a believer constantly think idolatrous thoughts? Can a thief claim to be a believer, though thinking without respite of how he may steal from his neighbors? There is surely in this text a notion of fundamental liberation from a constant life of sin, thanks to the Christian's washing purifying and sanctifying in Christ's blood as the classic form of reformed sanctification affirms. J.C. Ryle describes sanctification as, quote, that inward spiritual work by which the Lord Jesus Christ puts a new principle in the believer's heart, end quote. The Westminster Shorter Catechism, question 35, calls sanctification this, the work of God's free grace, whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God and are enabled more and more to die to sin and live unto righteousness. Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 13, paragraph 1. They who are effectually called and regenerated have a new heart and a new spirit created in them, are farther sanctified really and personally through the virtue of Christ's death and resurrection by his word and spirit dwelling in them. The dominion of the whole body of sin is destroyed, and the several lusts thereof are more and more weakened and mortified, and they are more and more quickened and strengthened in all saving graces to the practice of true holiness without which no man will see the Lord. We're told by advocates of side B homosexuality that only in the rarest of cases will a homosexual desire ever be diminished that under the rarest of occasions will a homosexual ever be able to claim to be a former homosexual. This from page 143 in Greg Johnson's book, Still Time to Care. Quote, I can't believe I'm about to read this. Paul wrote to the Corinthians to stress just how limited our transformation in this life is. I ask you, what other effect can we expect this to have than to lower the reader's appreciation for the transformative work of the Holy Spirit? We are in grave danger in the PCA of conceiving of God's grace as holy in terms of declarative reality and not at all in terms of transformative reality. And I want to be very careful in what I say here so that I'm not misunderstood as using hyperbole, but here it is. To tell Christians who are saved out of homosexuality that the Spirit's work in their life will be limited to the degree that they will almost certainly never be able to think of themselves as former homosexuals, that claim is blasphemous. It is blasphemous because it misrepresents the power and promises of God in the gospel, and it diminishes the work of the Holy Spirit, in effect lying about the Holy Spirit. I'm not advocating perfected sanctification in this life. The scriptures and our confession are clear on this. Sanctification is progressive, but sanctification will progress. But to say that homosexuals who are gloriously saved by God's transforming grace, such, as, such that they understand themselves to be former homosexuals, to call that unbiblical and triumphalistic and Wesleyan, is a grievous error and it contradicts the scriptures. Inside the homosexuality, the one who struggles against unnatural sexual desires is left with almost no encouragement in the battle against sin until he or she dies. Finally, I want to briefly comment on whether men who are gay but celibate, who understand themselves to have a homosexual orientation, may they be ordained to sacred office, because remember, that's what we're talking about here. We are not talking about whether or not homosexuals are welcome to come to our churches and hear the gospel. 
We are not talking about whether or not men or women who struggle against same-sex attraction should be welcomed into our church, that those who confess Christ should be welcomed into full membership of our church. They should be. They must be in the name of Christ. We're talking about who may hold sacred office. And again, I say this after a great deal of careful reading and studying and lots of conversations, but here's my conclusion, that a man who struggled is with unnatural sexual desires may be welcomed into the membership of our church, but it would be unwise at best to ordain him to sacred office. Imagine this one. Suppose there was a man in our church who was being considered for ordination as an elder. And he said, and I do not say this for cheap laughs. This is not meant for humor. I say this with all sobriety. And, but he says to us that he has to fight daily his desire to abuse his wife. You seek to clarify. So you ask him, you mean you get mad at your wife every once in a while? And he says, no, 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 no. It's far worse than that. I have violent fantasies against her. I, I, want, I want to wrap my hands around her neck. I want to strike her, but so far I've never had. He laments that Jesus did not make him nonviolent. I hope that we can agree that we would never ordain that man, even as we would welcome, welcome him to be a member of our church, to seek pastoral counsel, to see a doctor, to be under the regular care and discipleship of his elders, but we would never welcome him into the sacred office. So why is it that the PCA currently has elders serving who state those things precisely about themselves but in regard to unnatural sexual desires? I'll tell you why. Because the theology and the ethic of side being homosexuality has already done its work in our denomination. It's an important debate we're having. It must continue and we must remain focused, clear, and unbending on this. We also must be careful to watch our own hearts, to guard ourselves from sin. Being on the right side of an important debate does not hermetically seal us off from our own sin. And we must keep the gospel of Jesus Christ central and to proclaim that gospel with all the power of the Holy Spirit. I close with this from the 18th century Scottish American preacher and statesman, John Witherspoon. Quote, Christ came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. If you will rely on him for salvation, he will shed abroad the love of God in your hearts by the Holy Ghost, which will be a powerful and operative principle of new obedience. I beseech you, therefore, in the most earnest manner, not to reject the counsel of God against yourselves. Nothing can be more gracious than the offer of the gospel. I will give to him, that is, a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. There is no sin so deep a dye or so infectious a stain but the blood of Christ is sufficient to wash it out. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Todd, for that very powerful message. We're going to take about a five-minute break. My daughter is going to uh, unveil the stones. We thought about bringing uh, some Krispy Kreme donuts. Well, my daughter said no. Uh, there's something locally here in Birmingham that's far, far better. Uh, these are variety of stones. They're baked by a husband and wife. Uh, they are part of a PCA church, and so we want to try to give them the business locally. They are delicious. There's a variety. So take out a five minute break coffee, water, and stone baked locally. Thank you. 
I'm assuming this is being recorded. Yes, sir. Where will it be? It's on the Truth Exchange okay. YouTube channel. Okay. So just type in Truth Exchange, yeah. and I'll get you right there. Right. Yep.
Dr. Jones, Beckett, and sorry, you can go ahead and unmute your microphones now, and we will begin to say QA panel with Charlotte. Can you hear me? I can hear you. <laughs> okay, good. I can hear you. <laughs> All right, we need to get everybody back. You're over at the coffee table. <clears throat> Return to your seats, if you will. Bring your scone with you and your coffee with you. I want a scone. I want a scone, too. <laughs> <laughs> they are delicious. I wish I could put it right through the internet. <laughs> Beckett, we had to get on a plane to get a scone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we should have done it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We have everybody back. People coming in. Can you folks hear me? Yes. Yes. Dr. Jones. Good to meet you. Good to meet you. Joining us live from the internet for a panel discussion, Dr. Rosario Bowderfield, Beckett Cook, Joshua Gilo, and Peter Jones later on. Right now, I have uh, questions for Rosario, Beckett, and Joshua. But first of all, I want to briefly introduce them. I don't think I necessarily need to, but it's just part of uh, the procedure. Uh, Rosario is a PhD, Ohio State University, an author, speaker, pastor's wife, homeschool mom, former professor of English and women's studies at Syracuse University. She is the author of The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert, Openness Unhindered, The Gospel Comes with a House Key, and a brand new book coming out in 2023. Give me the name of that book, Rosaria. Five Lies of Our Anti-Christian Age. So you need to pay attention. Coming out from Crossway Good News in about a year, maybe a little over a year, it's going to be dynamic. We have in our package for this morning, chapter three, I think, a portion of that that you received. So read through that, uh, if you will. Beckett Cook, born and raised in Dallas, where I live. Uh, we have a lot in common. Uh, being from that, of course, I'm a convert to Dallas, but I love Dallas, and uh, I love Beckett, I love Rosaria, I love Joshua, uh, I love Peter. They are my friends in the Lord, and I uh, love what the Lord has given me, the new friends that I have. Uh, Beckett was raised in Dallas. He currently works as a production designer in the fashion world. He recently received his master's degree from Talbot. School of Theology at Biola University and spends much of his time in ministry speaking on the issue of homosexuality in the churches and the universities and the conferences. Please, when you go back to your churches, incorporate what you hear at this seminar into your churches. Have guest ministers, have guest speakers in your churches who speak on these subjects because your children and your grandchildren are not going to hear this anywhere else, but coming from solid biblical backgrounds, coming from solid, solid biblical sources. And Joshua Gillo uh, has served as a youth pastor, street preacher, evangelist. I never really thought of you as a street preacher, but amen. We all need to be street preachers. Uh, uh, evangelist, he is now director of operations for Truth Exchange. He has worked for Truth Exchange since 2011. Executive assistant to Dr. Peter Jones. Uh, in late 2018, Joshua relocated to open the East Coast office uh, in Columbia, uh, South Carolina, of the Truth Exchange, and he and his wife, Lael. That's my daughter. I have a middle daughter named Lael, L A E L. You know what the Hebrew translation of Lael is? Gift of the Father. This is a beautiful name. Um, 
I, when I was in seminary, coming to seminary, I was in a grocery store, and those of you who are in St. Louis, you will know the grocery store, Snooks is the name of the uh, grocery store. And I was in line with my wife, Lael was on the way, and there was this book, we hadn't picked out a name, and I came across the name of Lael, give it unto God, and I said, okay, that's it. If that just uh, uh, means a lot, and it does, and she's, uh, I'll be joining her later on this afternoon with my wife uh, and my grandchildren on our vacation as we leave uh, Birmingham. Um, I have a list of very important questions, not just because I made them up. I, I've studied these questions. I've studied the issues. So I think they are very important questions that I'm going to be asking uh, our panelists this afternoon. First question that I have top of the list is this. Do people who support side B disagree with Romans 1? You know Romans 1 well, as I do. Rosario and Beckett, uh, do people who support side B disagree with Romans 1? Uh, ladies, go first. Rosario. Well, in some ways, we start, I think, in the same place. But where we will disagree will feed into uh, Dr. Jones's very wonderful and controversial talk, because I think we would agree that uh, homosexuality is an ethical outworking of original sin. Uh, but that's, that's, that's where we are going to part waters. We all, I think, would agree there. But what, um, what I would say, and Beckett and Dr. Jones and, and probably all of you in the room is that the three exchanges that you see in Romans 1 set up a situation that requires, demands a, uh, a response. And so those exchanges are exchanging the worship of God for the worship of the, uh, for an idol, for the worship of man exchanging the knowledge of God for for lies, and then exchanging natural sexuality, which we'll understand to be heterosexuality, for unnatural and perverted sexuality. And um, because we can't just coexist with idols, we, we can't just have you know, have the idols on the high places of the big tent of the PCA, and we do our, our you know, our good confessional things in our confessional churches, God won't bless that. Because of that, it's not enough to say that, uh, that, that homosexuality is an outworking of original sin. Homosexuality is an attack on the creation ordinance. And what Pastor Aldo was saying, uh, you know, really spoke to that. Um, uh, you know, to suggest that biblical marriage is normative is not to say that everyone is going to be biblically married, but it is to say that in the covenant, everyone who highly values and supports what God calls good and strives for that will also be blessed. This notion that, you know, poor Greg Johnson will have no one to bury his ashes because he will be alone makes no sense. No Christian should ever be in that position. We are a family of God. So, um, so I would say we probably start in the same place, but we don't end up in the same place. Yeah, and I. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, thank you, Charlie. I, I would add to that. You know, there are a couple of points about Romans one. I think that holding on to a sec homosexual identity is is contrary to nature, and it, it's a suppression of the truth. Mm -hmm. And so that that kind of flies in the face of Romans one, and. Uh, also, it there's a kind of um, giving. It's there's a giving of approval to an orientation slash identity, which Paul is is uh, pro prescribing. So, I think that there is that that kind of tacit approval of a sinful uh, identity, a sinful orientation. So that probably. My question, do people who support side B disagree with Romans 1, would that be an excellent ordination question? Yes. So I think this is something you should carry back to your churches. You should carry back to your 
uh, oversight uh, committee you should take to Presbytery to say this particular question is critical. Do people who support the side B disagree with Romans 1 and then let them respond? Uh, very appropriate question. Um, this question is for Beckett. Beckett, you retracted your endorsement of Greg Johnson's book, Still Time to Care. Would you want to comment on that or would you just uh, uh, clue us in, inform us as to why you withdrew your endorsement? Thank you. Yes. Uh, so initially, I was pretty ignorant of what side B Christianity was or is until I actually until I had a conversation with Rosaria and um, and I was I was very ignorant of what side B Christianity was. I thought side B just meant the biblical sexual ethic. Uh, and so and then once I became more aware of that and uh, did further investigation into it, I realized that the underpinnings of his book had that the, the, there were side B underpinnings of his book and I could no longer in good conscience endorse that because when God rescued me, I mean, obviously biblically it's untenable, but when God rescued me out of a life of homosexuality 13 years ago, I wanted nothing to do with my old man. I wanted to run as fast as I could away from that identity, that orientation, that everything. I wanted to just run towards Jesus and towards sanctification, progressive sanctification. And so the idea of, for me, even in my book that I wrote in 2019, the idea of calling myself a gay Christian or even kind of wallowing in that old man seemed absolutely um, antithetical to the gospel. So I, uh, I had to withdraw the, the endorsement and as Paul says, I mean, Paul instructs us in Ephesians to put off the old self, which belongs to the, your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. And so I don't see how you can put on the new self, but still stew and embrace and wallow in your old man. That doesn't make sense to me. So that's why I that's why I had to to retract. Let me ask a question at this point because obviously it does go against scripture. But Romans one also deals with um, the 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 understanding, uh, common grace. All people uh, have that understanding. It is built into. It. It's part of our DNA. There are certain things that we know that are right uh, and, and are wrong. Uh, so would you say that that too? is part you know of your your understanding and that it's something that you flee from by nature as well as understanding the scriptural admonition against it yes i think that's part of it i think that um certainly you know romans one is a uh, is a yeah it's it's um help me out rosario because i i i yeah I, yeah that's a that's a, certainly a, a, an aspect of it I, yeah and and i think you know i, I don't know Beckett, i don't know if, if i'm speaking for both of us but i think for me one of the ways that charlie that question challenges me is you know i'm i'm body soul and and mind and i come to this conversation a really dirty rotten sinner so i have patterns of thought patterns of behavior and a biography that in some ways has really torqued that nature. And at the same time, I speak to you right now as someone who has been biblically married for almost as long as I've been a Christian, which is God's great blessing to me. But so what I think Beckett and I would both say is homosexuality is part of our biography, but it's not part of our nature in Christ. And at the same time, there's a, there's a tension. And when we were both at first converted, that was a pretty intense place to be. Not so much now. Very good. Thank you for those responses. I, I appreciate it. Um, Rosaria, this is a question for you, but uh, anybody else can uh, comment on it. Um, how are side B and A, and you use the word untenable, and 
In fact, uh, Rosario is an English major, an English professor. Uh, I had not been uh, having a way with words. Uh, uh, I had to look untenable up, and, and uh, I found out that it means you can't make it work. You know, that's what untenable means. You can't make it work. You know, even non-Christians could could understand that. You know, if they, intellectually they they look at the uh, the facts of the Bible. Uh, yeah, you can't make it work. Uh, so, uh, how are side B and A untenable, and yeah. why should this be so difficult for the church leaders to understand? Yeah, that's great. And I think what I'm going to focus on, I think that side A is so clearly false teaching from, you know, from from our perspective here in this in this group. That I'm just going to focus now on side B. Um, side B has a different understanding of biblical personhood or a different understanding of who I am as an image bearer of a holy God. Homosexual orientation is Freudian. It is not biblical. It denies the creation ordinance and it denies being made in the image of God, uh, Genesis 1, 27 to 28. What side B Christianity tends to do is tell you that you are made as the image of God. You know, and so I hear Greg Johnson say over and over again, God just loves all gay people um, and not Arminian. So I, I you know, it, not, I, can't, I, can't, I can't agree with that. So different understanding of personhood. The second is a totally different understanding of scriptural authority, temptation, desire, and redemption. Um, in the Gospel of John, we read in other places as well. I mean, scripture cannot be broken. John 10, 35, and among other things, this means that the word of God, and this is the hard thing for people like me, the word of God is actually truer than my feelings. And I think that's maybe something that Beckett, and I know Beckett and I have talked about this, that it means that the word of God is truer than our feelings, including our feelings of sexual desire. And the gay Christian, the side B gay Christian's investment in personal victimization simply replaces the truth of God's word with the manipulation of feelings. The third is that side B Christianity gives you a different understanding of sin, both original, actual, and indwelling. Psalm 51 reveals that the Christian must fight even unchosen sin. And to the side B gay Christian, if that unchosen sin falls under the category of homosexual orientation, then, then he just doesn't want to call it sin. He wants to call it a vulnerability, brokenness, um, or even just victimization. The fourth is that side B Christianity has a totally different understanding of the centrality of the cross. The blood of Christ does not make an ally with the sin it crushes on the cross. It never does that. Uh, fifth, Side B Christianity has a totally different understanding of justification and sanctification, which makes all of us wonder how it got to the PCA. All right. I understand how it was a spiritual friendship move or a, a, a Catholic, Roman Catholic, but our confession was the guardrail against this. Um, the Bible locates our sanctification in our justification, not in any idea that we're going to steward our sin. Uh, six, there's a different understanding of God's holiness. Um, God's holiness simply cannot abide with sin, including the sexual sin of homosexual orientation. And I would like to add just one last thing to this. And, and I, um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't intend this to hurt anyone's feelings, but side B Christianity is promoted by wolves. There are wolves in the church. And that is a problem. That is a very serious problem. Um, we are told, we who have stood against Side B Christianity for now some, what, seven years? You know, this is not the first time we've talked about this. We have not violated Matthew 18. Um, we have talked, I'm allowed to talk with anyone that my session feels is actually a Christian which means I have had some pretty testy conversations with most of the players we're going to talk about today. But when you write a book that disqualifies you, when you write a book and you tell us that coming out of the closet as 
a celibate gay Christian is good for the church. Um, when you set up these two polarities, and I think, you know, uh, uh, Pastor Pruitt uh, referenced this, um, this idea that um, there's some kind of an illusory truth effect is what Greg Johnson calls it in this book, that anyone is actually released from homosexuality. Um, and in fact, when you go so far as to say, which happens here on the same section that, that uh, Todd was referencing, that your spiritual siblings have no idea how much they are spiritual abusers by telling you to get back in the closet. This really puts me in an uncomfortable place. Uncomfortable because no one wants to be called a spiritual abuser. But actually, I am more uncomfortable being called a spiritual sibling when we aren't sharing the same gospel. So I don't know if it's true for Beckett. It's certainly true for me. I spend most of my time not talking to groups of people about what they should, who they should ordain. I spend most of my time in my kitchen, you know, at my table with people who are truly broken for their sin and struggling with it. And so I talk in a different way to those people. I don't, I don't preach a different, I don't proclaim a different gospel, but I certainly speak in a different way. But here's the, the, the point. Um, obviously where there's life, there's hope, but people who are proclaiming a different gospel ought not be ordained as your pastor. So I'm sorry, I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm not, obviously I'm a, I'm a pastor's wife. I hold no office in the church. So as, as we sit, tend to stay at the Butterfield house, I tend to invoke more kitchen discipline than church discipline. Kitchen discipline is swift. There's, a, there's not a lot of due process. If mother has a spanking spoon, watch out. Um, but I just think that's, that's an obvious. I'm just going to speak the obvious. Don't ordain people who proclaim a gospel that isn't the true biblical Christian one. And side B Christianity revoice is a different gospel. Well, I would like to just respond briefly to what you just said uh, by going back to the first General Assembly uh, that I attended in Philadelphia. And Elizabeth Elliott spoke at the uh, 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia. And it, it was a powerful message. You know, remember Elizabeth Elliott was the one who told the Indians who led her husband away, you are fighting against God. So the persecution, two things here. Your intellect and knowledge, as all of the ladies gathered here this morning, uh, is tremendous. You have the knowledge. Uh, you have the, the, the theology, and it needs to be expressed. And if the local pastor, uh, there are appropriate ways of doing this, if the local pastor is not doing his job, uh, then that message needs to get across somehow, some way. Uh, there are people here in our denomination today, if I met them on the street, I would very politely say, you need to retire. You've messed things up. I'm sorry that you have, but you just need to retire. But I would say it in a polite way. And I don't need to name names. Why? Because it would come back on me. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm very aware of things that are going on. No, but Rosaria very much like uh, Elizabeth Elliot, knowledge of scripture, the ability to teach it, going back as she did to those Indians, helping them to become, the men to become pastors, teaching them, not lording over, not being the, their pastor, but being their teacher. That's exactly what Rosaria is doing. Uh, and so the persecution goes along with it. And I would say, remind you of Elizabeth Elliot, you know, that, these people who led her husband away uh, were fighting against God, just as people today, many, many years later, are fighting against God. Yeah, we have to understand it. We have to live with that. Uh, another question that I want to ask you, uh, and I need my poster, Laura, where is, is it back here? My never poster. Yeah, if you'll get that for me. She didn't hide it. She just, uh, <laughs> when I came up with this idea, I had other people in my family, in my family say, 
my children especially, they said, Dad, you can't say that. I said, well, I don't know. It's, it looks pretty biblically accurate to me. So, but I want to show you what, uh, what I came up with. Uh, it wasn't a new idea, the format of it. The format of it uh, actually was the senator from South, from uh, um, uh, Joe Manchin from, uh, where is he from? Yeah, so well, in West Virginia, he actually came up with this for, for another message. But here's my message. Rosaria, I think you can see it. Beckett. All right. The Presbyterian Church in America will never be able to argue side B ordination where? In God's court. Where is God's court? In his presence. Mm -hmm. People say, who are you talking about? Where, where is God's court? It's where God is. It's in his presence. Can we go to God and ask him to bless what we are seeing now? Uh, as side B ordination in the BCA. If you would, Becky, if you would, Rosaria, uh, respond to this. And my question um, is, uh, is this here. Uh, some months ago, I created this sign, which reads, the BCA will never be able to argue side B in God's court or in his presence because it's unbiblical, untemple, and yet, Side B is discussed where? In our church courts. They're using that terminology in our, in our courts. I use it to clarify, you know, because I, I, I'm, it's incumbent upon, upon me to understand what side B really means. And I didn't know what it meant until a couple of years ago. So, but it's being actually used in our courts in, in, to figure out where this person is. And that's why. I have in my Bible study group in Dallas, uh, elders coming up to me and saying more than once from the same person, Charlie, what's so wrong about side B? Uh, anyway, your comments on this. I, 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 I drifted off here, but that's okay. Uh, it's, I thought it was important to get this message in. Rosario, Beckett? Well, no, I, I think a couple of things. I think. A, a lot of church leaders, just like I was, are, are just simply not aware of the of what side B, so-called side B Christianity is and how pernicious it is. I, I think that there's there's a lack of awareness. And also, I think there, there might be this impulse uh, in church with church leadership to because of maybe some, you know, guilt of how they may have mishandled this issue in the past historically there's kind of like i don't this i could be off but there's this idea of like oh well let's just throw them a bone and you know let's just this is okay we'll just kind of look the other way and throw them a bone on this kind of side b issue and but you know that's obviously <laughs> dangerous and unbiblical and so i think yeah i think we need to we need to, I mean, pastors and leaders need to be aware of what side B actually is. Yeah, and, and are you thinking, can I offer just three things? You know, one is that we are not talking about terminology. You know, I hear this all the time. Don't, don't police my terminology. You know, we're not talking, this is not like a fashion statement. We are a post Obergefell, post Bostock world. It might have been terminology 10 years ago. But right now it's idolatry. If you don't use preferred pronouns, you get fired from your teaching job. It, once the federal government enforces this LGBTQ plus language, the church needs to, should clearly know what side it stands. So that's one thing. The second thing um, is that it just reminds me what Beckett was talking about, reminds me of an, uh, an older sermon by R.C. Sproul about the weaker brother. And this, this sort of temptation to, for all of us to sh show our humility by being the weaker brother. And I think he says something like, okay, but don't make the weaker brother your pastor. And then the third thing I wanna say is just to quote Calvin. Uh, Calvin on 1 Corinthians 11, 19. 1 Corinthians eleven nineteen. 19, for there must also be heresies among you that they which are approved may be made manifest among you, about which Calvin says, heresies occur in the church when evil proceeds to such a pitch 
that it breaks into open hostility and people deliberately divide themselves into opposite parties so that believers might not feel discouraged on seeing the Corinthians torn by divisions, the apostle turns this occasion of offense in an opposite direction, saying that the Lord uses such trials to prove his people's constancy with a lovely consolation. He seems to say, we should be far from being troubled or cast down when we do not see complete unity in the church. On the contrary, we ought to remain firm and constant under threats of separation due to the lack of proper agreement, even if sex should arrive. For in this way, hypocrites are detected. So as hypocrites are detected, we know that the sincerity of believers is also detected. And I believe PCA, that's where we are. Questions for both uh, Rosaria and Beckett and uh, is this. Uh, you are both well-established authors with prominent publishers writing on the mo most moral issues of our day. Why do your message messages resonate? I, being in the publishing business, I realized that your a publisher is not going to publish your works unless they think it's going to sell. That's what I mean by resonate. So why are your books resonating with the public, but maybe not in the church, in the established church, do you want to respond? I, and maybe they are. I don't know. Maybe I'm off base. All right, Beckett. I'm going to. I mean, tell me if you think this is true. Um, I, if there's one thing that connects the two of us, it's that we are so willing to publicly repent. You know, I, I actually, I actually went to the Restored Hope Network conference two weeks ago specifically to repent to my brothers and sisters in ex-gay ministries um, about whom I have been critical. I bumped into Joe Dallas and he says, Rosaria, why are you here? I said, Joe, you can put it on my tombstone. I came, I saw, I repented. And he gave me a hug and he said, uh, you have to add one more line. And Jesus did all the hard work. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't know. Like, I just, I think that you and I have been just willing to say, you know, I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. Please forgive me. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. I yeah. And I mean, I think, you know, I get a lot of emails and uh, messages on social media regarding my book. And, and I think parents and just, uh, you know, Christians in general resonate with it because it is so black and white. It's so clear. There's no gray, there's no muddledness, there's no gray area. And, and, and I get what I hear from people is this is what I have been that's in. This is what I've been thinking for so long, but I haven't been able to articulate it. I haven't. And you have confirmed my convictions on this issue in all in different ways. And that I think that's that's one of the reasons I think Rosaria, too, her books are so powerful. Um, and and it it almost you know, it, it vindicates, I think it vindicates Christians who are so, because obviously the culture is so powerful and persuasive right now. <laughs> and it's, it's sweeping large swaths of Christians down the river. And so uh, I think it's just so, so refreshing for, for Christians, for believers to, to, to see, oh, wait a minute. Like, yeah, this is the truth. <laughs> and we're being lied to not only by the culture, but sometimes by the church and leaders in the church. So I think that's why it's, uh, it's so important. And also, I, I always say this, that we're, we're never neutral. And I, I think I got this from Dick Lucas. Uh, but we're either giving into the pressure of the world or the pressure of the word. We're, we're not just kind of static. And so that in the culture, as I said, is so powerful. And I think that's why people are drawn to rosaria's books because it's like they they're they're longing for clarity on this issue and and truth on this issue and so that's why i think that's the case well i think if we can keep that in mind people are longing people are longing thank you for the truth and you are giving that to them in your books uh, along with your marvelous personalities um uh, and it is a personality it's part of who you are, you're compassionate, 
you're loving towards other people, but at the same time, you know, you are uh, firmly embedded in God's Word. Uh, you're on fire for God's Holy Word. I want to leave this last question, and then we are going to get to uh, Dr. Peter Jones uh, in his controversial paper, statement. Uh, I'm leading with that because uh, uh, I'm a salesman, and, and I'm getting your attention, I hope. But it is. It is controversial, and, and that's good um, if it leads to the solid understanding of God's Word. But I want to, uh, this last question I would like for uh, Joshua to respond to. Uh, the question is this, that we've talked about curriculum to be used in the church, and it needs to be, from K through 12 and beyond, on the issues that we're talking about now. Why shouldn't we be able to gather our children around to talk about something that in church, I mean, in school, they're getting they're getting the other side. Why shouldn't we, in a conversation piece, uh, talk about this? So I want to ask Joshua to respond to this question. How can churches change their methods, but not the biblical message, in order to teach its members to be better witnesses? As far as methods go, I don't think we need any new methods. A lot of the methods that we have been given through our churches are good. Catechism. If you don't catechize your children, the devil will. And as Charlie said, they're seeing it in education. You see it in TV programs. Children as young as two are watching shows like Blue's Clues and Muppet Babies, where the characters are transgender or queer. You see it in music. So that it's no surprise that we see a sudden rise of younger people who are saying, I question my identity. I question what a man is, I question what a woman is. And some of these are the most easiest questions that you would think a little boy and a girl should know. What is a mom? What is a dad? What is a male? What is a female? Uh, through the exchange, the ministry I work for with Dr. Peter Jones, we have a great resource called Gay Identity and the Gospel. And in it, we have Rosario is also a part of this series. We have Dr. Michael Brown, of course, Peter Jones, Gabe Fleur. And we tackle the side A and side B gay Christianity. So that's available. There's other great ministries out there that have resources. I believe uh, Reformation or Heritage Press, help me on that, sorry, it has a new catechism uh, on sexuality. And, and within catechisms, it's important that you have to get down to the basic, fundamental root point is that God is the creator. And he made them male and female. You need to give children that massive structure, uh, simple category of God is creator and we are creation. So with that, I yield it. Oh, I should say, if you stop by the Truth Exchange table, we're right next to the RTS uh, booth. If you sign up, we're giving away a free copy of Dr. Jones's latest book, Who's Rainbow? It's forwarded by Rosario. So please come by and stop by and see me. Sign up. Let me uh, introduce Dr. Peter Jones by saying that what he is, what he's presenting to us this morning is not a sermon, although some may see it as a sermon, but it's a lecture. It's a lecture whose purpose is instruction. That is what a lecture is. Dr. Jones' subject this morning is androgyny. So if you've got your cell phone, look it up. Look up the definition of androgyny. I had to. And, and we, we are blessed by these academics, uh, Peter Jones and Rosario Butterfield, who challenge us with new terminology. And that should be a, a daily routine, just uh, looking up new words and, and, and incorporating it into your vocabulary. Um, Dr. Jones will argue this morning that androgyny is at the heart of a pagan, present pagan moment. Mm -hmm. I thought it was Luke that he wrote, but it's moment. Pagan, present moment. Dr. Jones is founder of the, and executive director of Truth Exchange, a ministry which exists to recognize and respond to the rising tide of neo-paganism. He is ordained in the Presbyterian Church in America, a former professor at Westminster Seminary, 
Reformed Theological Seminary in France, uh, is the author of the Gnostic Gospel, Strikes Back, Spirit Wars, Truth, Gospel Truth and Pagan Lies, Capturing the Pagan Mind, Cracking the Da Vinci Code, Stolen Identity, The God of Sex, One or Two, Seeing a World of Difference, The Other World View, Who's Rainbow, the one that uh, is available at their booth. And so we welcome you, Dr. Peter Jones, this morning to present uh, your understanding, uh, your lecture to us about um, androgyny, which is at the heart of the pagan present moment. And Rosario will then, after Dr. Jones' presentation, respond uh, to that, to his lecture. Dr. Peter Jones, we welcome you. Thank you so much. I feel very honored to be part of this event. Uh, I'm delighted to be speaking with my wonderful sister, Rosaria, whom I love in Christ. And thank you, Rosaria, for all you do. It's wonderful to meet Beckett Cook. I've seen his name a number of times, but now I see him in person. I hope the sound is OK. We've been having trouble with the sound. But um, I'll assume it's OK, and I will go forward. Indeed, what I have to say today, I gave a title sexual androgyny at the heart of the present pagan moment. I'm trying to place the issue of homosexuality at a crucial point in our existence that uh, ought to give us pause to think seriously about what we're doing uh, as we deal with this subject. And uh, some people have described the uh, homosexuality as androgyny. Now, androgyny comes from two Greek terms, aner and guni. Aner is man, guni, gynecology, is woman. So androgyny is the joining of male and female. Boy, are we seeing that today the whole call for the refusal of the binary in all kinds of areas. Androgyny is expressed sexually in a number of ways, in homosexuality, in bisexuality, in transgenderism, agenderism, drag, and cross-dressing. So all of these ways of being androgynous are in full display in our culture. And as I talk about this issue, I talk about androgynous sex, but I think I also, without realizing it, was talking about androgynous spirituality. So you have androgynous sexuality combined with androgynous spirituality. And these elements arrive uh, in uh, culture, in my lifetime, I watched them. Film. I didn't know what was happening actually when I came to the states in 1964 as a young student. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. Uh, as a European, I had never seen so much influence of the Christian faith on the culture in the biblical and Christian schools and printing presses and television and radio stations and so on. It was an enormous discovery I made as to the place of Christianity in America. And um, I never saw things like uh, the RuPaul drag race or the drag queen story hour. We never actually spoke about homosexuality even at that point. And so everything has changed. America was a thriving Christian nation, and uh, we just went along and thought that would always be the case. But the 60s and the 70s introduced into Western thinking what I call androgynous spirituality and androgynous sexuality. Androgynous spirituality, of course, 
is Eastern spirituality, which confuses, deliberately confuses the human and the divine. So that's the androgynous side of it. But um, this came into the culture, and uh, most of us didn't know what was happening. Though some people did know as they uh, spoke about the the religion that was underneath everything. George Bernard Shaw, a pro-Stalinist, socialist atheist, said, there is only one religion, though there are a hundred versions of it. So that was an appeal to a kind of spirituality that was not Christian, but that apparently uh, people like him uh, understood existed. And so that kind of spirituality for many, many years has been underground throughout Western culture. And uh, there are various ways that people have referred to this. The true religion, the great mystery, the sacred secret, ageless wisdom, and so on. So that kind of spirituality, which was very Western, came into uh, our Western culture as Eastern spirituality. I, uh, I'm always amazed at how profound and uh, deep thinking Bob Dylan was when he wrote the songs, the song, They Are a Changing. And I wondered how he knew what was happening. Uh, they were actually changing in the way people think about God. I, uh, When I got to the States as a young student, we were I went to a theological seminary and we were asked to study the death of God theology. And we were convinced, as was my professor, that this was the success, the victory of secular humanism, that there would be no God anymore. But what we did not know was that one of the death of God theologians, David Miller, in 1974, wrote the book, The New Polytheism, ah, which he showed would that the future would belong to the death of God as the rebirth of the gods and goddesses of ancient Greece and Rome. That was the prediction of this so-called death of God theologian, which meant, of course, that the God that was dying or was being killed was the God of Scripture, not the notion of God as such. And, um, you know, this came through in so many ways. I didn't realize that David Miller, the author of this book, was a friend of Carl Jung. And uh, Carl Jung predicted the threat that we were on the threshold of a new spiritual epoch, a new humanity. He called it the age of the paraclete, that is, of spirituality, which, quote, would signal the end of the Christian aeon by the invalidation of Christ. You see how you put to death the very notion of spiritual distinction by this notion of spirituality and putting to death uh, or the invalidation of Christ. And many people, of course, as we know, turn to this kind of spirituality. We used to call it New Age spirituality. Don't ever say that anymore. You'll obviously date yourself. But um, I think that many people turned to that kind of spirituality. So, you know, it became popular to say I'm spiritual but not religious. That is to say, I don't turn to any system I'm just spiritual in myself. What we were seeing, though, was the massive change of Western culture, uh, both spiritually and also sexually. Uh, two scholars, Fortson and Grams, wrote a book recently called The Unchanging Witness that demonstrated 
that for 2,000 years, the church denounced homosexuality as morally unacceptable. We were going for 2,000 years on this fundamental notion that the Christian church had spoken unanimously about the evilness of homosexuality. But what happened in the 60s and the 70s was the beginning of the discovery of the, quote, normality of homosexuality. And uh, I, I note Troy Perry, a practicing homosexual Christian minister, though he had been defrocked by his Pentecostal denomination, actually founded the first openly gay pro-LGBT church, the Los Angeles Metropolitan Community Church. So here we, set, we have a, a deliberate attempt to go against the 2,000-year culture uh, with regard to homosexuality by its normalization. We saw this happening as well in the uh, Episcopal Church where in 1994, a little later, the General, Assemb the General Con Convention prohibited discrimination against individuals who claim to be homosexual. And uh, in 2003, actually anointed a gay man as the first openly gay bishop, Gene Robinson. He was ordained by Bishop John Shelby, John Shelby Spong, actually his name was, who I remember I read his book where he denied the Trinity. So you have the denial of the being of God and the elevation of the homosexual practice. And we discover then, not surprisingly today, that many evangelicals share some of these same convictions. 36% I'm citing of evangelicals and 51% of millennial evangelicals favor the practice of homosexuality in a Pew Research Center poll. So you can see how after 2,000 years of a normal kind of teaching, we have radically transformed how we think in the space of my lifetime. So uh, I think that we need to realize that what is happening today is something quite new, and we need to step back and ask why it happened and how it happened. It seems to me, as someone who was doing a PhD on Gnosticism, uh, first of all at Harvard, then at Princeton, that the normalization of Gnosticism had a significant role. In 1945, we discovered 42, no, 52 original Gnostic texts. And uh, a number of liberal scholars started to say that this, these Gnostic texts were actually a form of Christianity. Indeed, they were possibly or doubtlessly the original form of Christianity. But Gnosticism gave ancient expression to the essential tenets of androgynous spirituality. And they were able to make the case that this was possibly original Christianity, hence the success of the movement. One of the friends of Carl Jung, June Singer, who was also an expert, by the way, in Gnosticism, wanted to show why Gnosticism was so important. And uh, she calls it the only uh, the discovery of these texts is the only vital act to a drama of cosmic proportions. Boy, this woman understood exactly what was happening. Uh, 
you see, Gnosticism, I'll just add this, this is not in my notes, but Gnosticism is the denial of God the Creator, and thus of anything significantly important about our physical being. And so it's a total commitment to spirituality, who we are as spirits, and thus if God is spirit and we are spirits, then we have in Gnosticism, this sort of androgynous spirituality. But uh, June Singer was an interesting person who saw herself as a spokeswoman for this spirituality, the New Age spirituality, which she felt was weak because it was simply based upon personal experience, and she felt drawn to the task of developing what she called a cosmology of this kind of spirituality. Cosmology, of course, means the, the structure of the cosmos, a whole worldview, and she gave herself to doing this. She says, I'll cite it, what lies in store as you move towards the long for a conjunction of the opposites is this. Can the human psyche realize its own creative potential through building its own cosmology and supplying it with its own gods? She wrote a book to try to show this, which interestingly has the title. The date of the book was 1977 androgyny towards a new theory of sexuality. So the cosmology of this new spirituality was then being focused on homosexuality, which she called androgyny. And uh, I think we have here a key moment in the development of thinking about our culture and about the need to have a cosmology. I'll cite one more phrase of hers. We have at hand all the ingredients we will need to perform our own new alchemical opus, the opus magnus of uh, satanic thinking, actually. She makes an appeal to that, the great work. The archetype of androgyny includes bisexuality, transgenderism, etc., as I said earlier, as an innate sense of and witness to the primordial cosmic unity functioning to erase distinctions. This was being said in 1977. We got to get rid of distinctions. We have to get rid of the binary. This was nearly totally expunged from the Judeo-Christian Judeo tradition and a patriarchal God image, end of citation. Interestingly, what she sought to get rid of was the primordial cosmic, well, what she wanted to establish was a primordial cosmic unity of humanity and the divine. So the elimination of the very notion of the distinct divine creator have you ever wondered, I've started to, why recently the LGBTQI plus agenda is now everywhere being promoted? It, it's just amazing. I, I, I'm a soccer fan, and uh, I watch the Premier League in Great Britain, and the captains have a captain's armband, and many of them have a multicolored armband as they play soccer. That's as far as it's going, just to the average human being. So sexuality, you see, is not simply the problem of, a, of human beings who feel a certain pull to the same sex, and I never had that, but I can understand how that would be a problem. Uh, 
It is that, but it's more than that. It is a deeply held religious belief system, whether gays know it or not, by the way, and I think many of them do not, uh, because it touches on the notion of the divine image. As we were talking about Romans 1 uh, earlier, Paul saw it this way when he said, it's interesting, there are only two ways to think about religion, and there really, he's also saying there are only two ways to think about sexuality. That's very interesting. The two ways of thinking about religion are theism or monism, what I have since called to try to be more simple, uh, twoism and oneism. <laughs> and uh, you'll probably get tired of hearing that phrase from now on. But there are only two forms of sexuality, according to Paul. Either heterosexual or androgynous sexuality. So isn't it interesting how these two notions go together in a Bible text? And uh, you folks, uh, Beckett and Rosaria, excellent uh, thinking on the subject of Romans 1, see that clearly. And uh, I think we need to understand what we're dealing with. It's not just personal feelings, <laughs> but it's actually the massive invasion of a pagan worldview through these personal feelings that many people don't realize they're doing. But one day we will and we will understand how deeply changed our culture has become. So I'm concerned to show that. It's interesting how in our culture, as I said, homosexuality is absolutely everywhere. I, I read a week or so ago about the um, drag reading and... Uh, Nancy Pelosi, the leader of our government, said, this is what America is all about, freedom of expression. So we are led by people who are actually in favor of this changing of the way we think about sexuality. So homosexuality, I think, is less a modern question of biological destiny or civil rights, it is that, than a necessary practice of our outworking of age-old pagan religious practice. Uh, to show that in a certain sense, let me send you to radical pagan, often lesbian feminists. For them, the age of Aquarius, you remember some of you that the um, that the age of um, the spirituality of the new age was called and was called um, Aquarian spirituality. And these pagan feminists talk about that as the second coming of the goddess, Sophia, the arrival of the Sophianic millennium. Sophia, they say, the divine savior of Gnosticism will lead humanity into another more peaceful and loving civilization because she will lead us out of the delusion of duality, the binary, and into the marriage of humanity with nature and finally into the marriage with the divine. Do you see that androgynous spirituality expressed in a very creative way? Oneism is the joining, you see, of distinctions and denying that there are ultimate distinctions. And so duality must, and the binary must be extinguished. And this will take the form of political reality. 
I didn't see this one coming, actually. What is the political form taking place? I was all into Eastern spirituality, but in recent days, I have to speak about the latest version of paganism, and that is wokeism. Ah, is that pagan? Is that androgynously spiritual? Well, I believe we can show that though we thought that the, uh, the socialistic and Marxist tendencies had been destroyed in the Cold War of the 80s, the 60s revolution actually was undermining Christian culture of Western civilization. As a student, I remember my fellow students shouting, hey ho, what do you know? Western Civ has got to go. And I never underst understood a word of what they meant by that. It was odd to me. Western Civ has got to go? I thought they just wanted freedom to practice their various choices of sexuality. So there is an expression then that we have come to see in what we call neo-Marxism that I do tie actually to the rise of androgynous sexuality in the following way. The Frankfurt School, some of you, I'll go very quickly over this. The Frankfurt School, which moved to Columbia University in uh, the, I think in the 40s, uh, began a period of the promotion of Marxist critical theory. But one of the key thinkers of this Marxist, uh, of this Frankfurt School, was a man by the name of Herbert Marcuse. Have you heard the, that name at all? I actually heard him speak at Princeton when he came to the adoring thousands of students. Again, I wasn't exactly sure what he was talking about, <laughs> to tell you the honest truth. But um, it's interesting to see how this neo-Marxist who came to the States to undermine the Western uh, structures of Christian culture was committed to sexual androgyny. He influenced many of the student students of the 60s revolution, and he wrote some books to this effect. His groundbreaking book, Eros and Civilization, called for polymorphous sexuality and the expression of life instincts. So he was understanding that the only way that you could actually bring about the arrival of what he called neo-Marxism was by destroying classic Christian spirituality, uh, sexuality. Now that's important that we retain that and understand it, that that's what's happening uh, as we see the students expressing themselves today. Also, like the old Marxists, he uh, was in favor of the destruction of the patriarchal family, which, of course, is tied to uh, typical classic heterosexuality. And so he thought that he could undermine society not by the liberation of the worker who had been long liberated by the successful uh, economic systems of, uh, of um, the present world of um, capitalism, but by the destroyal, destroying of the nuclear family and thus of androgynous sexuality. So our culture has been 
destroyed by both Eastern spirituality and now is in the process of being destroyed by Western Marxism. Am I being too sensational by saying that? Uh, you know, cultural neo-Marxism really is being introduced by the notion of postmodernism. And what is the basis of postmodernism? The French homosexual pedophile, by the way, Michel Foucault, who called upon the destruction of all binary distinctions. Old, young, man, woman, homo, hetero, dominant or subordinate. So that the postmodern evaluation of morals was really only the old Gnostic notion of oppression and the oppressed. And who are, who are being oppressed and who is the oppressor? Well, that's what we have to figure out. But we cannot use Christian notions of morality to establish that because, of course, postmoderns, especially of the Foucault school, were atheists. So I would argue that we have, we are observing in our time the second volume of the androgynous sexuality now proposed by neo Marxists. Progressive author Paul Keevil describes the old culture that uh, Mark Huser was trying to destroy as a Christian hegemony. That is, the everyday pervasive, deep-seated, and institutionalized dominance of Christian values. Thus, the Constitution has been labeled as a white male document of white privilege the evil incubator of capitalism and heteronormativity. You see how the joining of these political notions with sexuality uh, come together to destroy the very structure of our culture. So West, I finally understood what the students meant by Western serve has got to go. And they mean the Constitution, which is the only meaningful expression of Western serve, must be one day rewritten or replaced in the name of postmodern justice. It's interesting, uh, the neo Marxist. Atheist Black Lives Matter believes the following. To remake America, you must undo America. Undo, actually, by a Marxist revolution. So what we are seeing today as our culture gets more and more deconstructed, this is not because Biden is an old fudgy or whatever, it's deliberately done. He's being organized by people behind him who know they want to deconstruct Western culture as we've known it. And when we can deconstruct it to a situation where everyone is ill at ease, then they can propose a new system. So the great work is the ultimate goal. It's the destruction of the self as the image of God towards self-transcendence. Alistair Crowley, who was the founder of the satanic hermetic order of the golden thought, says, 
this is the this was his goal at the beginning of the 20th century. The great work is to open the creation of man by himself. That is to say, the full and entire conquest of his faculties and his future is especially the perfect emancipation of his will. So you see, uh, identity politics based on this wokeism is doing precisely this in proposing a new identity to ourselves and our culture. Dr. Jones, we um, need to uh, take uh, time, save some time for Rosaria to respond. We got, we're up against uh, almost at, at the hour, people will be leaving. So let me shift, if you will, and I apologize that for, for the interruption, but let me shift from you and your present, brilliant presentation and paper. Uh, and, and it is a danger that we face today if Rosaria, would you respond in particular on how this is affecting the PCA, um, unbeknownst to a lot of people? In it. And this uh, is being recorded, and I want it to be recorded. I want that message to go out. Uh, can I say one thing? What I can't do then is show that this is not my idea but it is the idea of people who study the homosexuality throughout the centuries and who claim that this is the goal of homosexuality to undermine the distinction between us and God. That's an important part of my paper that I apparently won't be able to read. That's important to realize that these people themselves say this. It's not Christian, the bigotry trying to say things that are negative about homosexuality. It's the very belief of homosexuality himself. Rosario. Yes, I, yes. Did you uh, hear my question? I'm sorry? Did you hear my question? Your, I did not hear your question. What was your question? Okay. My question is, you, uh, if you would respond uh, to Peter Jones' brilliant uh, presentation, um, and, and what we're faced with today. Yeah, as, as far yeah. as the PCA is concerned, because that's, of course, where we are today. Right. Are Right, absolutely. And I just, I love, I love Dr. Peter Jones. He is my, my, he is uh, my dear father in the Lord in so many ways. And this is a, this is a rich and important paper. You know, one of the things that, that Dr. Jones just said uh, at last is one of those moments where you realize that you do need the Holy Spirit to illuminate your minds as you are listening to Dr. Jones speak about cosmology. Because, um, and I'm sure Becca would agree, when, when we lived as practicing homosexuals, when people would talk about a gay agenda, we would laugh. You know, we thought it was funny. And, 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 you know, Beckett on his show has recently gone through the book After the Ball, which is the book about the gay agenda. And we all thought it was, you know, I don't know, parody, irony. Um, and yet here we are living out the fruits of that. And so that is why it is, it is very dangerous and very foolish for anyone in the PCA to think that homosexuality is simply a normal human variance or you have a pastor who's a six on the Kinsey scale, and that makes sense to talk about because what homosexuality is, is God's judgment on the world. And when homosexuality comes to the church, it's God's judgment on the church. And the implication of Dr. Jones's um, approach to cosmology is very, it's, 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 it's very powerful. And so, uh, Peter, I actually wrote up something that I think the audience has, and I'll send it to you. It's just a little five pages on what oneism and twoism is, and basically what you say in um, in After the Rainbow um, about uh, the three exchanges. So um, let me just summarize quickly because these You're talking are talking about this book. Yes, that one, that book. Who's, who's Rainbow? Who's Rainbow? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for putting in a wonderful forward to that. It was my honor. It was my honor. But in that book, Dr. Jones is going to talk about these exchanges in their cosmological purposes. We're so used to talking about homosexuality as a therapeutic issue, 
or maybe a missional issue that this might sound very strange to our ears, but we need to hang on here. The first exchange is glory for corruption. The second is truth for lies. The third is heterosexuality for homosexuality. And idolatry is going to change your glory, you person sitting right there, into corruption. Or what Dr. Jones is going to call the master plan cosmology and wokest androgynous politics. And what exactly is your glory? Well, 1 Corinthians 11.7 says that the man is the glory of God and the woman is the glory of man. Quote, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman and all things are made from God. Now, this pagan essence of Western spirituality that Dr. Jones talks about is something we really need to hang on to because, and this is something I know Beckett and I have talked about, it is an act of faith for a believer to say, the Bible knows me better than I do, but it's crucial because without, without you know, this is not anyone's intent, but we are all a little bit like, uh, you know, uh, you know, rock climbers who have now plummeted, you know, 10 feet deep in the snow and we don't know which way is up. And that's true for all of us. Um, the exchanges in Romans 1 lead to all manner of sin, including, and it's very interesting, exchanging characteristics that belong to God and now giving them to man. And we see this with especially our celibate gay pastors in the PCA. Um, we no longer believe that God is immutable. Oh, no, 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 no. I mean, we used to, right? We used to say that our eternal God is unchangeable in his essence, nature, and perfections, and that God is free from decay or alterations and manipulations, and his mercy is unchanging. But after pagan man worships man, believes lies, and ordains celibate gay pastors, what you're going to start to see is that now people believe that homosexual orientation is immutable. Can't change it, it's fixed. And it's God blessed in its fixedness. So we are in a very dangerous place, PCA. I mean, I hope you realize this, an attribute of God that provides stability of faith has morphed into a false attribute of gayness that provides soul destroying enslavement. And this is exactly what Dr. Jones is saying when he talks about the pagan essence of Western spirituality. So the issue isn't what you call yourself. We are not debating terminology. The issue is what you worship. And the great men of the PCA may deny that there isn't even a such thing as side B. All of us here are apparently very delusional for having the feeling like we need to talk about this. Um, and they may distance themselves from what they have in the past called God's best or lack of God's best for you. And perhaps they even want to see a course correction, but that's not enough, PCA. It is, it, it's, you know what, we are praising God if people want to back away from revoice, but that's not enough. Um, and the only thing we need to do is seriously and take seriously what repentance of sin means. Because as, um, as Pastor Aldo has said to us, we have tolerated this sin. We have tolerated the sin of revoice in the PCA for years. Some of the things that Pastor Todd mentioned, um, anonymous Twitter, I, I assume, reports, I, I, those are disqualifying statements. Those are statements that would, under normal and not abnormal places, disqualify people from being legitimately respected. But um, we need to understand that repentance has what Thomas Watson, the great Puritan calls six ingredients. And they don't include anything I've seen. I've read the reports from Missouri. I've, I've you know, listened to Greg Johnson's recent interview. None of that actually qualifies as biblical repentance. This is what biblical repentance is. We are disgusted by the sight of our sin. Acts 26, 18, the Holy Spirit allows us to reject homosexual orientation as a morally neutral personality aspect or what Nate Collins calls an aesthetic. 
um, and instead see sin as sin. That's what Beckett was talking about when he was first converted. He said, I wanted to run as far away from it. And that's because God in his mercy gave him eyes to see that sin is disgusting. And then we have to have a sorrow for sin. That's, that's Psalm 38, 18 and Psalm 51. The Holy Spirit gives the believer a godly sorrow such that the believer could not defend or participate in the Revoice Conference, even, even in their little secret Facebook page. I hear there are some interesting screenshots on there, but I'll let you know if they're ever sent to me. The only place I might post them is on my refrigerator so I can pay for, pray for these people. The third is confession of sin, real confession. Nehemiah 9.2, Daniel 9.6. The Holy Spirit gives the believer the grace to entirely reject our previous embrace and love of sin, not celebrating it with conferences that embrace semi-Pelagianism and Arminian soteriology and doctrines of sin, such as revoice. In other words, we do not minimize the danger of sinful temptations, and we do not provide conferences that celebrate it. The fourth, the fourth is an interesting one. It's not one that modern ears want to hear, but it's biblical. Shame for sin. We're to have shame for sin. Uh, Ezekiel 43.10, Luke 15.21, the Holy Spirit gives us discernment. And we know that for the believer, the blood of Christ covers our sin. And since the blood of Christ never makes an ally with the sin it crushes on the cross, we do not see our sin as a benefit to Christian missions. That's heresy. Our shame for sin takes any notion that the church benefits from our sin and, and simply destroys that. The fifth is hatred for sin. Um, Romans 7.15 and 7.23. The believer must hate your sin without hating yourself. It's, it's a particular spiritual grace that only a believer can manifest through the illumination of the Holy Spirit. And finally, the sixth is a turning from sin. And we see this in Ephesians 5 and 6 and Isaiah 55, 7. And when we turn from sin, we recognize something that, Dr. that uh, Pastor Aldo has, has preached on um, very powerfully, that our new nature leaves no room to be dangling back between Adam and Christ. So when we say that, that homosexuality is an ethical outworking of our original sin, as believers, we're not saying that we're still hanging on to Adam. We have a new nature and we need to remind ourselves of that. Turning means going in the opposite direction. And so coming out of the closet, even as a celibate gay pastor supports the LGBTQ plus religion and cosmology that Dr. Jones represents. And in our post Obergefell and post Bostock world, this is idolatry and it cannot be tolerated. And just in case you wonder how we should not tolerate it, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 leaves us with our mission. For the weapons of our warfare are not the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready, ready to punish every disobedience when your, dis when your obedience is complete. Brothers and sisters in the PCA, it is my prayer for you that this is going to be your moment of public covenanting, that the confessionals in the PCA will heed what has been said at this conference and heed what Dr. Jones has said and publicly covenant to stand for what is true. And uh, may God be given all the glory, regardless of the uh, heat that you will take. Thank you. Thank you, Rosaria. Thank uh, everybody uh, who attended, uh, our panelists, our speakers, Aldo, Todd, Beckett, uh, Peter, Joshua, uh, my daughter, for assisting me here. And uh, uh, it has amazed me that as I talk to my daughter, she is grounded in Reformed theology, loves Reformed theology. I learn a lot from her. And uh, it used to be she learned a lot from me, and I hope she did. But uh, she, um, uh, I sometimes go to her for advice, and uh, I thank the Lord for my daughter. Let me close, and I want to return to uh, 
my opening for our paraphrased ambassador, John Gwinnett. I'm very glad to be here. There is no place I would rather be at this time than in Birmingham. Thank you for coming this morning. May the favor of the Lord rest on us, establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands, Psalm 9017. Thank you for coming. The Lord bless you. And throughout this day, throughout this week. Thank you, Rosaria. Oh, thank you, Peter. Thank you so much. Thank well, you, thank you guys. I'm afraid, I'm afraid I only got to read half of my talk, you know, which is a shame. But um, anyway, I think I've got some of the main points. I was interested to note yesterday reading how political this stuff is becoming. I read that um, the new incarnation of the Disinformation Governance Board and a new incarnation of it is to be a safeguard against mistreatment of prominent women and gays. So we will have a government organization that will be judging whether we are fair to homosexuals. And uh, I, I think that can go a long way. Yeah, 